We're continuing on in this series that we've been calling Messy Church. And if you were here last week at either of our locations, you heard a sermon on the first part of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And uh, that was really all about how the resurrection is essential. The resurrection is essential. And so we talked about how the resurrection is essential to the gospel, how it's essential to our faith, how it's essential to our future, and finally, how it's essential to our lives right now. It was a great passage to go through together, really encouraging to think about the resurrection and its implications for us. Uh, But if you were to keep reading from last week, in chapter 15, and you were to read past 34, which is what we read last week, uh, you would realize that that was actually only part one of Paul talking about the resurrection. The rest of chapter 15 actually explores the understanding of the resurrection even further. And so today, the sermon that we're going to be, uh, uh, that I'm going to be giving is really part two of uh, chapter 15. We're going to be talking really about how the resurrection will work, how the resurrection will work. Now, I love this line of reasoning because I've always been fascinated with how things work. You know, I was the kid who um, I, my parents had a set of Encyclopedia Britannica. Who remembers those, right? My parents had a set of that, and it was on the shelf. And I would always, like, grab it and pull it out and look at Encyclopedia Britannica because I was super fascinated with how the world worked. I wanted to know about that. Uh, that was before Google, right? We didn't have Google back then when I was a little kid. And so uh, Encyclopedia Britannica was like that, you know, like you could just go and look up whatever you wanted and you could find fascinating things about our world. But it wasn't just books that I was fascinated about. Um, Sometimes I would go into the garage to this like nice organized area where my dad kept his tools, you know, and I'd I'd take a, a screwdriver and open up one of my toys just to see what was inside of it, right? Like I was that kid. I would take apart my toys there's not really anything in plastic toys. Did you know that? It's like nothing. It's boring, okay? Um, But I also um, would do this. One time I took my dad's radio apart, right? I was like, what's inside a radio? And I took it apart. I want to know how it works. And uh, I put it all back together. Don't worry. Don't worry. And uh, I went to go turn it on, and it didn't turn on. So that wasn't cool. Um, But that's just like stories about how fascinated I am with how things work. And I think really this is just like a human inclination. Like we all kind of want to know how things work. Like we all wonder about these things. This is why Google is so popular, right? Like you can just like ask Google anything you want now. Like how does that work, right? And so um, we are super curious about how things function. And so as we relate that back to our passage today, um, we're going we're gonna, to um, look at the Apostle Paul, and he's basically anticipating the people at Corinth asking this question, right? He's just talked about the resurrection. He's talked about the essentiality of the resurrection, and now he's going to begin to anticipate their question, well, how is this going to work? How is this going to work And in fact, it's really interesting that he takes the time to write this to the church because at this time period in in human history, the resurrection from the dead wasn't actually a concept that was accepted in the culture. In other words, like, no Roman person was like, oh yeah, resurrection from the dead, that's a thing. It would have been a ludicrous idea to them. Uh, The theologian N.T. Wright puts it this way. He says, Christianity was born into a world where its central claim, which is the resurrection, was known to be false. Many people believed the dead were non-existent. And outside Judaism, nobody believed in a resurrection. In the Roman world, everyone knew that dead people didn't and couldn't come back to bodily life. And so after uh, just proving the essentiality of the resurrection in the first part of chapter 15, Paul now finds it necessary to not just stop there, but to tell us how it's going to work. So how the resurrection works. So if you have your Bible with you, um, I invite you to turn it now to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's always 
great to follow along. Uh, you can also actually look up this on your phone and follow along that way, or we will have it on the screen as well. But since we are opening God's word together, will you go to God in prayer with me? Let's pray. God, you are so good to us, and we're so thankful for your word. And Lord, we pray this morning that as we take a look at this second part of 1 Corinthians 15, that you would um, just work and move in us, that you would help us to see how the resurrection works, and that you would help us to find our hope in the fact that Jesus has been resurrected and that we will follow him, and that one day we will be resurrected from a perishable body to an imperishable body. I pray, Lord, that you would write that on our hearts, that you would help us to realize that, and then we would live accordingly. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we're going to read through this whole passage because I want you to get the whole context of it together and to see this whole argument that Paul lays out, and then we'll kind of break it down. So 1 Corinthians 15, 35 through 58, this is what it says. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? How foolish. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined, and to each kind of seed he gives its own body. Not all flesh is the same. People have one kind of flesh, animals have another, birds another, and fish another. There are also heavenly bodies, and there are earthly bodies, but the splendor of the heavenly bodies is of one kind, and the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. The sun has one kind of splendor, and the moon another, and the stars another, and stars differ from star in splendor. So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown perishable is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that, or, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man is of heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. And as of the heavenly man, so are also, or so also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must, must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So here we have from Paul how the resurrection will work. And in order to wrap our minds around this, there are really four ideas that I want to talk about. The first one is this. We start with a dead seed that goes into the ground. Look at back at verse 35. It says this, Someone will ask, how 
are the dead raised? What kind of body, um, what kind of body will they come? And right away, Paul begins to identify and address these skeptics. In other words, it's as if those people are asking Paul this. They're saying, if Christ really is the first fruits of the resurrection, and dead people will be resurrected in the future, how will that happen? And what will the resurrected people be like? Right? You could imagine people even saying this to us today. Like, there's probably still skeptics today who would say things like this. You mean to tell me that there are dead people that are rotting in the ground that are going to be brought back to life? Are they going to be like Frankenstein? Right? Like, are we going to, like, stitch them together and then they electrocute them with electricity and they're going to come back and they're going to be like Frankenstein? Right? Or are they going to be like zombie corpses? Like, zombies are super popular in pop culture right now. And so, are they going to be like zombies? Is that what they're going to be like? Uh, what about the people who were burned to dust with fire? How are those people going to be resurrected? Right? Or picked clean by wild animals or just, like, absorbed into the earth? How does that work, Paul? Like, how is this all going to work? To which Paul answers quite boldly in verse 36. He says, how foolish. In other words, in modern vernacular, you idiots, right? Paul's like, he, he goes right back at him. He, he, he poses the skeptic question. And then he says, you guys are idiots because, listen to what he says. He says in verse 36, what you sow does not come to life until it dies or unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or something else, but God gives it a body as he has determined. And to each kind of seed, he gives it its own body. And then he goes on to describe all these different types of bodies. And it really follows the creation account in Genesis, right? And he, he's talking about uh, people have one kind of flesh, and animals another, and birds another, and fish another, and heavenly bodies, and the sun, and the moon, and the stars. And he talks about all these different things. And really, the simple illustration here is that Paul is talking about the seed being planted and it's through a process that God has determined that it begins to grow into something completely different. And, and so just, just do this with me for a second. Think about something. Um, in my old house, my wife had planted a bunch of tulips in our yard, right? Anyone like tulips? In the spring, they come up. They're beautiful. My wife had tulips all over around our house, and they were really beautiful, and they came up in the spring. And imagine for a moment that you come over to my house in the spring and said, I would love tulips like you have at your house. And so a few months later, I come back to you, and I hand you a brown paper bag, and inside the brown paper bag, you look in there, and what do you see but a bunch of tulip bulbs? They're like brown, they're crusty, and you look in the bag and you're like, what are these? These are not tulips. And I say, well, you wanted tulips in your yard, right? You wanted tulips in your yard, here they are. Well, if you didn't know anything about the process of growing tulips, you might think, Bill Gates just gave me a bunch of dead plant matter, right? Like, what am I going to do with these? They just, they look like they're dead. I, I wanted tulips. These are like dried up bulbs. And this is along the lines of what Paul is saying about the resurrection. There's actually a process for the resurrection secured by Jesus that we need to understand in order to know how the resurrection will work. And the process starts with the dead being buried in the ground, but they don't remain dead. That's the thing. They don't remain dead. Just like a seed must be buried in the ground and seemingly die in order to sprout up to a new life, we must die in order to sprout up to the new life that God has called us to. Furthermore, the point we can't miss here is that Paul is pointing out that it's God who determines what the process will produce in the end. And I think his idea here is to appeal to us to remember our biblical perspective on who God is. This passage is meant to pull us back to the creation account in Genesis. See, God determines how things look and function. And this passage in Corinthians says, God determines its splendor. 
In other words, we should be looking back at creation and say, if we believe in the God who created all the things in heaven and the earth, the, the moon and the stars and the animals and the fish and the birds and people, if we believe in that God, then we should also believe that he could do it again in our resurrection. Amen? So God can resurrect us to new life that is a lot more glorious and different than the life that we even have now. We're going to talk about more about that in a little bit. So the first step is that the seed must die and be buried. And that brings us really to point two. The plant comes to life when the seed gives out. Look at verse 42. It says this, So will it be with the resurrection of the dead? The body that is sown perishable is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. It's raised in power. It's sown in a natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. If there's a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. And, and so we get more information from Paul as he continues this illustration. Uh, jump back to me with this idea about this, this bulb or a seed. Think about this. Just like a dirty brown crusty bulb or seed is put into the ground and then later it comes out as an amazing flower or maybe you planted an acorn and an oak tree uh, sprouts up or maybe you planted this little tiny seed and all of a sudden you have a vegetable plant. Uh, this is the same nature of what will happen in the resurrection for those who have trusted Jesus. You, we die with a mortal body, but we are raised with an immortal body. We die with a body that's not appealing because think about what happens at the end of our lives. Uh, death is not so pretty. Our bodies are probably not in great condition if we're dying. And so the, that's the physical effects of sin. But when we are raised, we're raised to a glorious new body. We, we die with a body that's weak, but when we are raised, we have a body that's powerful. When we die with an earthly body, we are actually raised with a body that is fit for heaven. Because if God, the creator, could fashion humans from the dust of the earth, if our God can do that, then he can also transform us in the resurrection so that we would have a body made for eternity. This is why Paul says to them, how foolish. Because if they were to step back and think about it, that's the God we serve, the God who created everything from nothing. Now, the really interesting thing here is to step back for a second and to think about Paul's understanding, right? Just step back for a second from this passage and think about Paul's understanding of our lives now and death and resurrection and how that's actually in direct contrast to how the culture thinks about it. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. Paul makes it clear throughout his writing that he actually thinks of life, life in general, as that which follows death. Do you hear that? Paul's thinking about life, like true life, what real life is, as that which follows death rather than something that, becomes, that comes before it. In other words, in Paul's view, the life we have now is actually just a faint shadow of the life ahead of us in Christ Jesus. Right now, we're kind of like brown, crusty bulbs, but in the resurrection, we'll be like flowers, right? This is why Paul says the seed must die before it can really live. Listen to what one commentator says about this. He says, Paul's comment about life following death actually confronts the common Greco-Roman view that even if people do have some kind of existence after death, it's likely to be this like dark, colorless, and shadowy existence compared to the fullness of our experience in our bodies prior to death. In other words, this is the way our culture, this is the way the world thinks about death, right? Like you die and you go to a shadowy, dark place, and if there is something after death, it must be this like, you know, black and white idea of like, there's not real life there. Uh, but the afterlife to which Christians ultimately look forward is not like the experience of a leaf that falls to the ground and has, dies and is rotting away, but it's actually more like that of a seed. This is what Paul's talking about. That germinates and then enters into a flourishing life of color and beauty to which its previous existence is hardly capable of being compared. 
Listen, our hope as we look forward into the future is that our best life is ahead of us. Our, the, the best life that we will live as followers of Jesus is ahead of us in resurrected bodies with King Jesus. So right now, we're like grubby little caterpillars, but when, we'll, when we are resurrected, we're going to be like beautiful butterflies, right? We're going to get to fly around. I don't, I don't know exactly, but it's going to be completely different, and our life in the life to come is going to be much better. And so that really brings us to our next idea. We transition from natural bodies to spiritual bodies. Verse 45 says this, so it is written, the first Adam became a living being. Now, uh, think back at Genesis. God takes the dust of the earth, and he creates the first man. And then all mankind comes after that, right? And then it says this, the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The last Adam. That's talking about Jesus. That Jesus is the last Adam, the last um, person who's going to, like, pave the way for how people who follow Jesus will be from time in the future. And, and so the spirit, it says the spirit did not come first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth, that's Adam. The second man is of heaven. Jesus is showing us a way of being a heavenly person. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. And as of the heavenly man, so are those who are of heaven. Jesus, again, is paving the way of who we need to be in order to be in heaven. And so just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. And so in this part of the passage, Paul is really contrasting the quintessential natural man with Jesus as the heavenly or the spiritual man. And Jesus is really referred to in this, this passage as the last Adam. That's really important to understanding this passage. And it seems that the main thrust of Paul's argument here is that we follow the model or the form of human beings all the way from Adam until now. But in the resurrection, you and I will be following the model or the form of Jesus as somebody who is fit for heaven. A heavenly man. Verse 49, and just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. That's Jesus. And, and so let's go back to our question. How will the resurrection work? Remember, that's what Paul is talking about. How will the resurrection work? Well, just as we were born into natural human bodies like all of mankind, now in Christ Jesus, though our mortal bodies will die, we will be raised into heavenly bodies to be like Jesus. You know, I talked about this in the sermon last week, but, you know, the only example we really have of a person who has a resurrected body, like that which we will have when we are resurrected, is Jesus himself. In fact, in our passage last week, we talked about how Jesus was the first fruits of the resurrection. And, and so we do get some sort of understanding of what our resurrected bodies will look like. And, and so just think about this for a second. The resurrected Jesus— comes back, and he walks with two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And as they're walking with him, he appears as just a normal, physical person next to them, right? They don't recognize him uh, until he reveals himself at the end, but they, he's just a normal person walking along the road with them. And so he, he just seems to be a, regularly, a regular physical guy. Um, Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, actually serves his disciples breakfast, Right? You remember that story where like Peter jumps out of the boat and swims ashore because he can't wait for them to row? And Jesus is there and he serves them breakfast. He eats bread and fish with them. He eats, he eats with his disciples. Um, listen to this. This is kind of interesting to think about. Jesus invites Thomas. Remember doubting Thomas? He invites Thomas to touch his hands and to look at the wound on his side. Right? So like, actually, there's a physicality to who the resurrected Jesus is. He's a heavenly man. He's spiritual. He's fit for heaven, but he's also physical in some way. And, and also in the accounts, he purposely either didn't make himself known or he looked different enough that sometimes people didn't recognize him at first. And, and so maybe resurrected bodies will look a little bit different or you have the fact that he seemed to appear and vanish at will. I mentioned this last week as well. So maybe we have different capabilities in our resurrected bodies. It's possible that 
you know, like we would be able to appear or maybe move between dimensions. I don't know, right? Like it's speculation at this point. But the sense that you're supposed to get is this, that we will be the same physical form in some ways, but in a lot of different ways, we will be really different as our resurrected bodies. We will move from mortal to immortal. That's how the resurrection will work. And it really brings us to our last point, which is this. This new body is permanent. It's imperishable. It's imperishable. Look at verse 50. It says this, I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. Um, I had a lady tell me last night, I just wrote uh, uh, verse 51 in a card to new parents who brought a baby home. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. <laughs> I like that. That was funny. I thought I'd share that. But anyways, in a flash of an eye, in a twinkle of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. We will be Change for the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. If you skip a little further down, it says, um, This is when basically death is defeated. It says, Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Man, our hope is wrapped up in that, in the implications of the resurrection. Now, what's interesting here is that Paul communicates something really important to us. It's actually how necessary the resurrection and our transformation is in order to be part of God's coming kingdom. You know, it's not like an optional thing. Like, you, you, you were like, well, I'd like a resurrected body, but it's not a big deal. I mean, whatever. No, you actually need it. He says that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the imperishable inherit the imperishable. It seems that there's a sense in the future kingdom of Jesus that requires our glorified, resurrected bodies. In our current state, as we are right now, we could not exist in the new heavens and the new earth with Jesus. We have to be transformed. In fact, that's so true that Paul even explains that those who are alive on earth at the moment that Jesus returns— will instantly be transformed into our resurrected bodies, even though we didn't die. Uh, do you see that verse? We will not all sleep. That was the one I made a joke about. You should remember it, right? We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. When Paul talks about sleep in the New Testament, he's almost always talking about believers who have died because they're not really dead, right? They're going to be resurrected. So he, he's refuses, he refuses to say that they've died. He just says that they're sleeping, right? So we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In other words, there's going to be people Right? And when he returns, those people, as well as the dead in Christ, will all get resurrected bodies all at the same time. And this is really fascinating to think about. There will be a, a moment in the grand story of humankind where all followers of Jesus, present and history past, will be transformed from a mortal form to an immortal form so that we can live eternally with King Jesus. And actually, Paul says that this is the moment when death will finally be defeated as well. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that, w then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? I mean, this is really incredible when you think about it. I mean, I guess I didn't really understand this before grasping how Jesus is going to do this. Like, I, I would always ask the question, like, how does God destroy death? Like, how does one go about killing death? Like, isn't death already dead? Like, how do you kill death, right? Like, this is a hard problem to solve. Well, the resurrection of Jesus did it. The resurrection of Jesus and his followers is the answer. Part of God's plan for his followers is that he would transform us through the power of his resurrection from mortal beings to immortal beings. Once that is realized, death really no longer has its place. It's effectively eliminated because all the people who will then be alive can no longer die. 
And that's our ultimate hope. All right, so we've seen really clearly this morning how the resurrection will work from this passage. And it's a really awesome truth for us to reflect on and think about. But how should it affect our lives today? Like, how sh- what, what does this mean for us today? I want to close with talking about the last verse of chapter 15. This is what it says. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Uh, I had a Bible teacher tell me always that every time you see the word therefore, it's there for a reason, right? Every time you see the word therefore, it's there for a reason. I always remember that because you should be thinking about what was just said, okay? So chapter 15 is all about the resurrection, the essentiality of the resurrection, that it's essential for everything, and also how the resurrection will work. And because of all of that, therefore, my brothers and sisters, stand firm, let nothing move you, always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that the labor in the Lord is not in vain. The implication of this passage is that as we look to our glorious, resurrected future where sin and death will be no more, we should use that knowledge to stand firm in our faith in Jesus right now. We can steadfastly follow Jesus through persecution, through trouble, through pains of this life, through suffering, because we have a glorious future with Jesus. But not only that, Paul says that you and I can actually um, wholeheartedly throw ourselves into the work of laboring for Jesus in his kingdom because it's going to pay off. In other words, it will always be worth it. Your labor in the Lord is not in vain because you're quickly moving towards immortality with him. In other words, the work you do for the kingdom is worth it because God's kingdom is eternal. And you will eternally be part of it. And so you need to hear this this morning. Listen, growing in Jesus and following Jesus right now is worth it. Your discipleship, the way that you um, follow Jesus and grow deeper with him, listen, that is worth it because you get to spend an eternity with Jesus. Spending time in prayer is worth it because you're building a relationship with the God of this universe. Bible study is worth it. Discipling others is worth it. Doing your job, the job that you do on a normal everyday basis, when you do it to the glory of God, it's worth it. Uh, Leading others towards Jesus and planting seeds of evangelism is worth it. Shepherding your family towards Jesus is worth it. Being a life group leader or a children's ministry volunteer is worth it. Giving up your sin to be more obedient to Jesus, not because you're trying to earn something, but because you love him, is worth it. All the kingdom work whether it's inside the church or it's outside the church, is always worth it because of the reality of the resurrection. Therefore, it's worth it. Nothing you do for Jesus in his glory will ever be in vain. All of it is worth it because we are moving toward a resurrected eternal future with King Jesus. And so the application of this whole passage is actually really straightforward. Jesus has been resurrected from the dead. We will too. So live like it. Actually live like that. This week, throw yourself in to the work, into God's work, into kingdom work, because guess what? It's worth it. It matters for all of eternity. I promise it will be worth it. If you believe in Jesus and you follow him and you're doing his work, you're discipling your family, you're loving people around you, you're sharing Jesus with the world, that will always be worth it because it matters for all of eternity. Will you pray with me? Lord, um, I pray that you would, as a result of our understanding and knowledge of these words about the resurrection— that you would put in our hearts and you'd put in our minds that the work that we're doing for you and will do for you is all worth it. Lord, I pray that you would help each of us to stand firm in Christ Jesus. It seems that our world is going crazy in many different ways. And Lord, I know, Lord, that you're calling us to stand firm in Christ Jesus because of the resurrection. 
Lord, I pray that we would, that we would stand firm in the resurrection and the truth of that, and in, we'd stand firm in Jesus, but also that we would labor because we know that we don't labor in vain, that we would seek to love you with the way that we live our lives, that we would throw ourselves into kingdom work right where you have us, in our jobs and in our families and at church. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.